everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and today we are going to cover two one-shot comic books that came out recently that I just haven't had time to cover. Uh, one of them is a, a, actually quite old. It's uh, probably like eight or nine months old, uh, which is called Venom the End. So I have a copy right here. Uh, so we're going to talk about this uh, briefly, but first we're going to talk about something really briefly, which is uh, Savage Avengers number one, Empire. Uh, this was a one-shot. I thought it was going to be like one of a three-part miniseries. And so when I picked it up and read it and I realized it wasn't that, I was really glad it wasn't that. Um, so we're going to dive into this first. And before we get into it, I actually have the digital code for this. So boom, there you go. If someone out there wants a free copy, just go to Marvel's website there, put, go to the website, put in the code, and enjoy that free comic book. Um, that'll be a copy of this, Savage Avengers number one. And then we're going to talk about spoilers for both of these. So if you don't want any spoilers, turn away now because I'm going to dive right into them. So Savage Avengers... We covered the first, I think, six-issue arc by Jerry Duggan because it had what appeared to be Venom in it, although we weren't really sure whether it was the actual Venom symbiote or if it was, it didn't have Eddie attached because I think uh, there was like one symbiote in a jar and then one that broke out and bonded with Conan, um, but it, Eddie was nowhere to be found in that book. Um, and that was one of our complaints about it was that we were like, w is this Eddie? It came out around the time where Eddie and the suit were separated. So we just figured maybe it was just the suit out traveling the world, you know, for a while before it reattaches to Eddie and the, in the Venom book before Absolute Carnage. So we kind of assumed it was during that, like War of the Realms time. Uh, but in this book, apparently it was Eddie, which doesn't make any sense because we didn't see Eddie anywhere in those first six issues. Although I think maybe Savage Avengers, I know that book kept going. And I read, I think, the second arc where like, uh, it's like Conan and there was like an annual too where they, it was like he teams up with Namar, I think, and he gets brought to Latveria and then gets moved to Egypt or something. So I did read up into that point, but I don't remember Venom coming back into the book. Again, it could have happened after that arc, I, for all I know. But uh, as far as I know, that was the only time a symbiote, whether it was Venom or not, because we still weren't sure at the end of that book, I think it was Venom, but we, we just know Eddie. Um, but I think that was the only time Conan and the symbiote teamed up was in the first six issues of Savage Avengers. Um, so it's weird that they team up in this one in Mexico City. For some reason, Eddie's in the suit and he's just down there without Dylan and he wants to go check out some museum. So it would have made sense if he said, oh yeah, I I'm bringing my son down here. We're going to go check out some museums. But he doesn't. He just says, I'm here. I'm just down here to check out some museums. So I'm like, so Eddie's just on a vacation in the middle of absolute carnage or, you know, like right after absolute carnage, uh, after he left to be on an island or something. So, um, so I don't know. It's a, it's a little weird, like the, t the timing and place of this. Not that that matters too much, because what ultimately matters is, is the story good and um, is it entertaining? And I would say no to both of those questions. I mean, Jerry Duggan's a nice guy. You know, we, he was nice enough to let us interview him right before Savage Avengers came out. Really cool guy. If, if I ever saw him, because when I worked at Lego, I would see him pop in sometimes. And he was always really nice. And I love the guy. He's great. He's an awesome person. But this book, I think, is terrible, uh, to be honest with you. Normally, I'm, like, way more PC about it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not, like, as blunt. But uh, I really, like, there's, I don't know if there's, like, this book was just, hard to read um not like in a like i didn't understand it kind of way but just like how basic and silly and dumb it was um it venom doesn't appear till about near the end of the book like the, if, if this is like a three-act structure structure venom comes in like towards the end of the second act uh you know so it starts off with conan going to like see um some luchador wrestlers in mexico city and the artwork's okay it's a little plain but the lines are very clean i actually like some of the color work on it too um and he goes down he sees a bunch of luchadors fighting and he's just like um oh this isn't real fighting and then he so and then some guys hear him like what are you talking about wrestling is real and then he's like fine so he starts beating up the guys that you know yelled at him and then he's like happy about it. he's like ah, all right he punched him each in the face like great i had a nice brawl that's what i wanted to so he writes conan to be like this this you know big dumb guy who just likes to punch people um, which is kind of true, I guess, a little bit. But um, but then this giant tree shows up uh, from the Empire story. I'm not reading Empire, so I don't know what's going on. Um, so this giant, so I'm just going to buy into a lot of this stuff and just assume it's part of the overall story. But this giant tree shows up with these alien creatures in it, 
and uh, and they all attack Mexico City. The reason they attack or chose this place to attack is because, as they say, there's very few superhuman people down here in Mexico City, which I find hard to believe. I feel like now in the Marvel Universe, New York alone has so many superpowered people that I can't imagine other big cities around the globe don't also have a bunch of superhero people hanging out in them. And then coincidentally, they attack Mexico City and they say, oh, there's a few superheroes here, but but not many. And then the two they run into are two, like Conan and Venom. Like, I'm just like, well, this seemed like a great opportunity to put in some like Mexican superheroes, you know, uh, or something. Maybe one of the luchador wrestlers, maybe that's a secret identity. Maybe he's actually a superhero. Like there's a couple of things they could have done in this that might've been more interesting than telling a Conan Venom story because it's it's really boring. Like Conan takes down a couple guys, he gets shot in the arm with an arrow, it's poisoned, he blacks out. Uh, he has this vision of this this giant woman uh, that he once, you know, was an enemy of his that he used to terrify. Now she's not afraid of him anymore, but it turns out that was just kind of a hallucination. And Venom shows up and it's just some of the worst dialogue ever. He says, uh, you seemed like a cool dude when we were fighting that wizard, so I'm going to cut you some slack here and tell you the previously on for you, man. And then he says, some space aliens just dropped out of the sky and uh, f like Macho Man Randy Savage. And they totally screwed things up in this city. And he's like, and I'm just down here on, uh, you know, to check out the museums. And I saw you and I figured I would team up with you because you seem like a cool dude from last time we teamed up. Uh, just awful, awful dialogue. Just awful, awful dialogue. <laughs> and so he gives um, like Venom or Venom hands uh, Conan like one of the parking meter things. And then, you know, Conan's like, hey, this will work as a bludgeon object. And then they go and fight the tree people and kill them. And then that's pretty much it. Um, and uh, yeah, and then there's like moments like this where Venom's in a truck, which you're kind of like, ah, that's funny. It's kind of reference to the cartoon. But then he has the worst dialogue ever. He says, fire in the hole. And then he says, run, dude. And you're just like, okay. Uh, and then he says, get trucked. And he throws an exploding truck at the giant tree and it explodes and whatever. Um, and then the two of them hang out and eat tacos and drink afterwards at a concession stand that surprisingly wasn't crushed by the giant tree that blew up. Um, and that's it. And that's the book. Uh, the one thing I thought was kind of neat in this that I think Jerry Duggan put in here was, uh, was this. It was like a little map of where Conan's been since he's been in the Marvel Universe so far. And they put it in order so you can track kind of where he's been. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of neat for those who just want something neat and extra to kind of it helps you with the continuity of like what events happened in what order. Um, but then that also, by knowing what's in the back here now, kind of put into question what I actually read in the book. And I hate when writers do that. They're like, hey, look, I'm keeping track of the continuity. And then they proceed to write a story that uh, it kind of ignores the continuity. And you're like, uh, okay, whatever. Like if the suit would have said, hey, it's me, like we teamed up. And then Eddie goes, I've never met this guy before. And then, you know, the symbiote could have said, yeah, it was when we weren't, you know, uh, connected, you know, during the War of the Realm stuff. And he's like, but uh, I teamed up with this guy or whatever. And we fought a wizard. Like if it was something like that, I'm like, okay, that's keeping in with the continuity. Because there was no sign of Eddie at all in those uh, those stories from the first six issues of Savage Avengers. At least as far as I know. I mean, it didn't seem like there was any. Um, so again, I, I don't like when writers are like, hey, look, I'm paying attention. Oops, no, I'm not. Like, And I see a lot of writers do that nowadays. So um, so yeah, I know Jerry Duggan writes like four or five books. So you know, it could be one of those oversight things. But that's where editors come in. And editors should really work on this stuff too. So in the end, I give Savage Avengers a one out of five. I just thought... The dialogue was horrendous. Everything was just happenstance, how everyone ends up where they are. Um, yeah, like I said, there's a little bit of a, a thing for Conan of like his trajectory. So you're kind of like, all right, he's heading up you know, to North America from South America, stops in Mexico City, sure, but Eddie, why is Eddie looking at museums uh, down here? Like all of that's just terrible. Um, the giant tree people were kind of boring and, and lifeless. Like I said, I don't know how much they tie into the overall empire story but I just found them to be uninteresting. And for a $5 one shot, I gotta say like, I, I feel like this was a real waste of money. Uh, the art's okay, uh, it's fine. That's why I gave the book a one. And like I said, Jerry's a nice guy and there's been other stuff he's written that I've liked, but this is like, this was just bare minimum effort as far as writing goes, in my opinion. And again, the guy writes like four or five books, so it could be one of those things where it just kind of, you know, fell off where he was like, I, I I, you know, I got to just do like a fun buddy beat em up storyline or whatever. And it's like, great. But even like dumb movies like Hobbs and Shaw 
had more like reason for characters to get together and more motivation for things than something like this did. Like this was literally just mindless dumbness. And like, and maybe that's what he was going for. But, uh, but I don't know, like I'm of the mind of when you get an assignment to write a comic book, no matter what character it is, it's like an actor, like a, a lot of actors, they are, they want the work so bad that you give them a, a role and they're like, I'm going to research it. I'm going to look into it. I'm going to do my best version of this character that I can, whatever movie it is, small role, big role. We talk a lot about that in the Venom movie where it's like little, you know, small characters in the background or have one or two scenes. Um, we talk about them and like the actors and actresses who portray them and what they deliver and what they bring to the scene and stuff. And it's like, you know, that's what I feel like. I feel like every book or every assignment you get or every acting job you get, that's your opportunity to show your best at all times. And so maximum effort is where it's needed. And honestly, I've seen more effort put into tweets from a lot of current comic writers than I've seen for them from them in their own comic books. And uh, and I'm not saying Jerry's like that. I haven't I've really paid attention to his Twitter account. Uh, when I was on Twitter, I'm not on there anymore, obviously. But to, I, so I don't know for sure if he's one like that. But I just know from meeting him and talking to him, I know he's a nice guy and I know he puts, he works hard on a lot of stuff he puts out there, um, like his Deadpool stuff and things like that. But, and that's a character I never really liked, but I kind of liked him and Brian Pesane's Daredevil, uh, Deadpool run and some of the other stuff he's done at Marvel. But Savage Avengers, like those six issues, just felt like it had cool stuff in it. But if it didn't have Venom and some of the other stuff, I felt like it would have been a stronger book. And then same with this. I feel like if this was like Conan teaming up with like a Mexican superhero, I think that would have been way cooler than having Venom in here because um, it just made no sense to have Venom in there. Like, it just didn't. So, uh, but hey, here we are talking about it on this on the show, I guess. So, um, for all that reason, I just, again, I, I think Jerry Duggan is not a good writer for Venom. Um, I think he doesn't know what to do with that character. Uh, and, and maybe he should just kind of stay away from Venom from now on. Uh, at least that's my opinion of him, of his, of his writing. Um, all right, so the last book we're going to talk about today is Venom the End. Uh, now, this book, I got to say, uh, this was written by Adam Warren, who I don't know anything about, um, and drawn by Jeffrey Chamba Cruz, who I also don't know anything about. This is the weirdest comic book <laughs> for Venom I think I've read in a long time. This is so strange. Uh, honestly, it's just the weirdest. Um, it's not a simple story. It's, I feel like Adam Warren may be on drugs, actually. Um, it feels like somebody trying to be like Grant Morrison without the talent of Grant Morrison. Um, this book, but I, but it's not bad. Like, I'm not going to say it's the worst thing I've read. It's certainly not Savage Avengers Empire number one here. Um, it's certainly better than that. Uh, but it's, I just feel like there, there, there's like two or three different tones that Adam was trying to go for in this book. And then, but but as far as like visual tones, I think that's probably more on the art side uh, with Cruz's art or Chamba's art. Because um, the, the, the verbiage in this book is just a lot of big words and some of them not real words, like a lot of them, like some of them are comic book words, um, but it's like dealing with the Tesseract and it's, it shows the history of the symbiote. Apparently Venom lives to, for another 1.5 billion years. Um, and fights some giant uh, celestial looking thing called um, the, the God Mind in the future. So you got this big spread here. Um, like I said, it feels like like a Grant Morrison, like, oh, I'm gonna, because Grant Morrison does this thing where he'll write a book and then he'll get near the end and he's like X-Men when he did his new X-Men run. And the last arc was like in the far future, like 150 years in the future. And it was him and Mark Silvestri doing like this, you know, storyline that's set in the future. Jeff Johns did that at Green Lantern. He gets to the end of his run and the book called uh, Green Lantern, The End. And then the last issue, he jumps to the future and, and, and you know, and t tries to put a button on the Green Lantern universe. And then uh, that was also, and it happened another time too. There's like a bit, uh, Grant Morrison did it um, with Batman. I think he jumped ahead and told like a, um, a Damian Wayne future story and stuff. So all these things... It's like, it's, it's a trope, you know, that you see sometimes in comics where someone's like, I'm going to go to the future and tell the end of something. Well, that's what Marvel did with this. That's why they branded all these stories the end. And actually most of these, the end books are terrible. I don't like them at all. Um, with the exception of actually X-Men the end, 
they did a proper version of that. Actually, they had Chris Claremont come back and they did three six issue miniseries um, to tell X-Men the end. And I thought that was awesome, like that they gave it that much time and space, 18 issues of, uh, of wrapping up all these threads that Claremont set up back in the day that never he never got to pay off, like who Gambit is. Um, and in that book, they explained that Gambit is actually a Mr. Sinister clone. Uh, so all that I actually kind of liked. I was intrigued. I didn't love X-Men The End, but at a, compared to the other The End books, I didn't hate it. Um, but some, most of the other The End books, I'm not a big fan of. I think Hulk The End's okay, too. Um, but most of the other ones are, are not very good, in my opinion. Especially Wolverine The End, that was a terrible book. Um, which is a shame, because Paul Jenkins wrote it, and I love Paul Jenkins. But, uh, but this, The End, I haven't read the other ones that came out around this. I think this was like one of four or five other The End books that they released. I was only kind of interested in reading this one. And I think uh, Lonely Symbiote sent me a digital copy and I read it and I was like, I, and I felt discombobulated. I was like, I feel disconnected from this. Like I, I it, maybe I just need to get a print copy so I can examine every page and really like immerse myself in this story. So I've read this thing like four or five times and I still got to say, I, I don't really like it. Uh, it does do something in it that I do like uh, that is an ability of Venoms that doesn't get touched on a lot. And they do deal a lot with memory. So I liked those two elements. I thought those were great to use for a final Venom story. But really, the halfway point of this book, I felt like should have been the end. And they could have told like a really neat emotional story and cosmic story leading up to that. And I'm talking about the death of Eddie Brock. So we're going to dive fully into spoilers here if you haven't read this. Um, you know, Go check it out for yourself. I think this is one like Savage Avengers. I'm glad I gave away the digital code so someone out there can read it for free and not be worried about it. But I wouldn't recommend you go spend money on Savage Avengers Empire number one. This I'd say spend the money on actually. It's five bucks. And I think this is much better use of your five dollars than the other book because it's at least interesting. Um, it goes through different times. So you have these arrows that pop up, the time arrows, and they tell you what timeline you're in or like what, what how far away from the golden age, which is modern day, uh, that you are. And what they do is they tell the story where the suit is so codependent on Eddie that as Eddie ages, you know, past like 100 years old, the suit has to kind of fortify him, has to build in these pillars to hold Eddie up. So as organs fail, the symbiote replaces the organs with like a symbiote you know, organ, essentially. And then as Eddie's mind starts to deteriorate because the human body isn't designed to exist for 150, 200 years. So after he trying to heal him every day didn't work, the suit started put, replacing organs. And then after that, had to replace like his vision and had to replace uh, parts of his brain as it deteriorated. And then finally, it just kept struggling to the point where it, it could barely keep Eddie alive for an extra month and then an extra week and then it struggled to even keep him alive an extra minute before he died. So I thought that, I'm like, that's very emotional and that's like a really neat end to that relationship and it shows how the symbiote is would not let go. I mean, that's the whole thing about the suit, right? Is that when it finds a compatible host, it doesn't want to let go and it really fell in love with Flash and then it had to let Flash go and now it's back on Eddie and it's it's happy being back with Eddie, although it's it shows it in weird ways because apparently it's erased parts of Eddie's mind and memories and stuff or altered them in some way. Um, this touches on that a little bit, but really what it touches on is that the Venom suit at some point has bonded with almost everybody in the Marvel Universe during its existence. So it was able to tap into like the powers of Storm and, and, uh, and, and Quicksilver and all these other beings to kind of fix... Uh, bio life forms. So in the future, uh, Eddie, after Eddie dies, he's one of the last humans that die. There's big wars and everything that happen on Earth. Tony Stark transfers his mind into uh, like an Ultron type robot. And these Iron Men Ultron robots are policing the world. Um, but it's not really Tony. It's, you know, it's, it's not a bio life form. And the symbiotes need bio life to exist. So after Eddie dies, the suit goes, okay, now let me tap into my codex look at all the powers that I've accumulated over the years and let's see if we can't recreate human life. And that's kind of the mission the symbiote goes on, which is definitely interesting for sure. But I think that could have still been told while Eddie was dying. So it's like, all right, Eddie's going to die. 
I got to come up with a plan B for after when he dies. And then you could have still ended the book with Eddie dying and then the suit going, okay, well now I'm going to go into plan B and try to, um, you know, pro, you know, create new life. Or the suit could have said, I don't want to live any longer, uh, especially without Eddie. And I held on to him and, and I tortured him essentially by keeping him alive for an extra 70 years after he, he shot, probably would have died of old age. And I kept him alive longer and, and it was torture on him and his body and his mind. And now that he's gone, maybe I deserve to, to die too. Like that could have been an emotional ending as well. And that would have fit the title Venom the End because it would have been the suit dying with Eddie. Um, but instead they just go on this drug-induced field trip through time that this writer takes us on where, uh, you know, Eddie or the suit taps into the codex that's inside of it. And it, like I said, it uses multiple mans because uh, it bonded with multiple man at one point. Although I think that happened in, um, what was that storyline? Old Man Hawkeye. So I'm like, is that continuity then? I guess so. Because uh, I guess the end stories aren't really like current Marvel continuity. Like it builds off of that, but it's like a drifting potential future is what these are. So I can, I'm like, all right, fine, whatever. It, 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 it's counting Old Man Hawkeye in it. That's fine. So um, so the symbiote uses the, the Janie Madrix DNA and creates multiple versions of himself so he can build an army. And then through each of them, they uh, build a planet where they're able to use the Madrix uh, DNA to create duplicate life forms, like uh, human-like life forms. And then they use Storm's powers to create an atmosphere on these alien planets to, um, to help these humans grow into adulthood. And then the suits bond with them and then they all live in harmony. But then the God mind shows up and they have to deal with the God mind. And then the Tony Stark Ultron bots show up and they got to work together with them to destroy the God mind and all that. And then there's a big symbiote war at some point. Um, so it gets really crazy. It gets really convoluted and, and weird. I was able to follow the story. Like I said, when I read it the first time, I was kind of a little like, okay, I wasn't expecting that. I got to go back and reread. So now that I've had this physical copy, I've actually read it a few times. And every time I read it, I pick up on a little something that, or I connect a dot that I didn't connect before. So I got to say for that reason, the effort is there. Like they put in hard work to write this really crazy storyline. And the art is actually simple. Again, clean lines and everything, kind of like Savage Avengers. Um, but it works too. I mean, the artwork is, it's not mind blowing, but it's, it's still serviceable. It does its job. You, you, between that and the dialogue, you kind of get what's going on. But this is one of those instances where I feel like the writer wrote too much. Like, like it's almost, it's like you don't get paid by the word in comics. And this writer wrote like they did. Scott Snyder does that sometimes too, where it's just exposition, exposition, exp because just looking at that panel, you can't really tell what you're supposed to be feeling or or what knowledge you're supposed to have by looking at that panel so boom let's insert a paragraph here to explain everything and that's kind of what's going on there's no dialogue between these two it's just all exposition and that's where like from a writing standpoint i feel like adam warren it, like it's like dude streamline your ideas like i feel like he was just like let's just Let's mention mutant genes and, and terra, uh, uh, tesseract uh, coda, codices and uh, all these things. And he's like bringing in all these concepts and all these things. And, and it just, it's like, dude, it's all, a lot of this is unnecessary. You can trim a lot of these paragraphs that he writes. You can trim down to like one sentence, some of them, um, or actually a big chunk of them. Um, because it's just, it's a lot of overwriting, I feel. Um, and I think it's, it's there in service of, oh, look how weird we are and how smart and interesting and, and it's like well you're not really accomplishing that in my eyes at least um I, it just feels like you're overwriting um for no reason and uh and then so at the end you know you find out that venom is bonded to this woman he doesn't know or he, he knows who the woman's name is but and so does the narrator but the narrator which is venom i think doesn't want to tell you who the woman is um and then actually no i don't think the narrator is venom i think the narrator is something else um, but then at the end, the suit gives up the last human it was bonded to, which was, like I said, this woman whose identity we don't know, and then uh, reforms into a, a bonds with the Tesseract that it had, that it had the abilities of for, for generations now, and creates an entirely new universe. So it's, he's able to tap into, um, or the symbiote is able to tap into the multiverse and create a Venomverse, where um, all the DNA in his codices, like Eddie's DNA, and uh, Cletus Cassidy and, and, and 
I think Cletus Cassidy or Peter Parker, Flash Thompson. Yeah, not Cletus Cassidy, uh, Flash Thompson and um, Jamie Madrix and all these characters. Now they get to all go exist in a, a, a Venom verse. Um, so that intrigues me. That's another idea in here where I'm like, all right, I'm intrigued by that. But again, I feel like you still could have done that right after Eddie's death. Like to me, this should have been a more of an emotional journey of the suit. Because the biggest theme I think in Venom is codependency. It's it's uh, two life forms that that are attached and, you know, literally and uh, spiritually and emotionally, and they don't want to let each other go so much so that the symbiote's willing to alter Eddie's memory so it'll stay with him. And then it goes even further by keeping him alive when Eddie's dying, you know, like it's filling in gaps in his brain. It's it's replacing like lungs and, and organs and stuff inside of him just to keep him alive a little bit longer. That's really tragic and sad in a lot of ways. And it shows the inability of that both of these people like Eddie and the suit have the inability to, to let go. And I think that could have been a good theme of let's find a way to let go. And then at the end, you know, maybe them realizing like, you know, could still have the ending where they create the Venom verse, but have that right after Eddie dies. So that way it's like this sad moment. And then, hey, but you know what? You know, be a symbiote, be like a seed to a new world, uh, go back to this moment, change things and create the Venom verse or whatever. Again, all those elements are here in the story, but I just would have structured it differently and I would have taken out a lot of the overwriting and I would have focused more on the 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 drama of uh, of Eddie and the suit saying goodbye to each other for the last time because you don't really get that. It's kind of grazed over really quickly so you can dive right into the suit tapping into all of its codices and using Storm's powers and, and all that stuff is neat, like I said, but have that at the end when they create the venom verse like hey be like hey i'm putting in humans here and i'm using storm's powers to create an atmosphere and now we've made another earth in this you know another milky way galaxy with my powers and it's because i tapped in all the codex codex powers that i have and used it to form this universe like that's neat and like i said that could have still happened like it does in this book but just right after a really sad goodbye with eddie and then uh, and then you could add venom kill the mind god and then you know do that or whatever um so yeah uh i don't know um i'm surprised they didn't wedge null into this storyline i gotta say that i'm really surprised there but i'm guessing because donnie probably has plans for that and they probably told the writer hey don't worry about null just do something else so they put the you know god mind or whatever that thing is called uh in there so i don't know like this storyline i don't hate it but i don't love it it certainly has ideas in it that i find intriguing but structurally and pacing wise and stuff it's, I feel an absolute mess in a lot of ways. Um, and it all for the sake of trying to be weird and out there and clever and stuff like that. So, you know, you know, good for you, Adam Warren, for not writing like a, a generic flat book like Savage Avengers Empire was. Um, I appreciate the, that you put thought into this, whether I like it or not. I appreciate that there's at least thought into this and it's not super linear and it, it kind of jumbles around like memories do. I kind of liked all that stuff, but I also, when I look at the meat of it and the over explanations, that's where I'm like, okay, well, I don't like any of that. Uh, so I felt like all the ideas were here, but some of the execution wasn't handled very well, in, in just my opinion, obviously. Um, but you guys, let me know what you think. Did you like Savage Avengers Empire number one? Have you read it? If not, hopefully one of you got the free code and or have you read Venom the End? And what are your thoughts on that? Like if I'm if you agree with me, disagree with me, whatever it is on either of these books, I'd love to hear it down below so we can have a conversation down there because I really did. Like I'm really shut Savage Vendors down really quickly. I read it one time and I was like, this was a waste of my time and my money. Venom the End, like I said, I've read numerous times. That's why I haven't made a video on it yet. I'm like, I'll wedge it in somewhere else, but I got to read it a few more times just to see what else I pick up. And for that reason, I got to say, that means that means work and effort was put into it. And so I can't really fault them uh, at all, uh, you know, as a critic for the effort that was put in, because I feel like this was someone's attempt at hard work or was their hard work, not even attempt at hard work. I feel like this was hard work to do. And this, I felt like wasn't. I felt like this was phoned in uh, from a script standpoint. And although the art is not my favorite art, um, the artist and the colorist definitely worked really hard on it, I'm sure. I mean, I certainly can't do what these people do. But I think the colors, I thought, were stood out more to me than the art in this book. So, yeah, I, I, I give this a one for, for art-ish and colors. I give it a one. Um, but this, I actually give a three out of five. 
I'm, I'm a little above the middle. It's not a 2.5 for me, it's a three. So it's definitely more positive than negative. Um, but I just feel like the overriding is, is, is what hurt this. But, uh, but overall, I think it has some neat concepts and that's why I wanna hear what you guys think. So let me know down below. And as always, we'll continue our conversation down there. And I have more videos coming up soon. We're gonna talk about more of Sins Rising uh, coming up. And then we're also gonna dive into Venom number 27 and 28 when 28 comes out. So I'm gonna wait for that issue to come out. And then maybe that day or week or whatever, I'll record something then and I'll deliver it to you guys, uh, you know, in a video. So thank you all so much very, you know, for watching the show as always and for supporting me. And hopefully these videos go up soon after I record these. Uh, but if not, thanks for being patient with me and I'll get more content and Venom Vlog stuff up to you guys very soon. Thanks so much. See you in the future. Peace.